You're very welcome to Space to Grow, brought to you by Sunnis, Ireland's leading bathroom brand. Now, in this podcast, we explore how the spaces we inhabit shape us as individuals. I'm Lisa Cannon. And I'm Natasha Rocca-Divine. In this episode of the entertainment series, we are thrilled, aren't we, to have celebrity UK interior designer Pearl Lowe via Zoom right there, joining us here in the Devlin to share her experiences with the spaces she's inhabited through her life and career. So let's kick it off with Pearl herself. Pearl. Pearl, how are you? Greetings over in the UK. It's such a delight to have you on Space to Grow with myself and Natasha. Firstly, congratulations on your new book, Faded Glamour by the Sea. What a piece. Thanks for having me on. I'm very excited. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, now you are no stranger to interviews, but it's lovely to talk to you all about your book. Now, in the book, um, it features so many inserts like that of some of your old friends' houses. And you've been very good because you've inserted inserted more pieces into this series with the new book. Basically, I suppose, you know, Pearl, you've given us lots of treats. Yeah, I mean, the thing is, I think just to do a book about my house would have been a bit, a bit boring, really. I think, I think everyone wants to see other things. And there were so many incredible places where we were that there was, you know, like a we put a railway cottage, we put a little beach shack and there was just so many lovely things. We just had to include them in the book. So, yeah, I mean, this is your passion, Pearl, textiles, interior design. I mean, your mother was also an interior designer. So do you think maybe it's something that was born out of you or it's a reignited passion of yours? I mean, I've always kind of decorated, even when I didn't know what I was doing. So like when we bought our first house in 1996, I think it was, um, I just started like painting, experimenting. I I'm apparently, I well, my husband said I painted our front room 12 times and we were only in the house two years. So I just really kind of got into like mixing things and trying to experiment. And so, and we, we used to, we're serial movers. So we used to move every other year. So I've got, I've had a lot of practice. And so, but I love it. I love that's, I, it's, I kind of use it like a sort of a, a canvas, like a blank canvas. And I go into a house and then I just have this theme and then I, I do it all up and then I get bored and then I want to leave. <laughs> Well, personally, I'm inspired by lots of interior designers. I really like like Rachel Ashwell. She's mm -hmm. like shabby chic vintage. Yeah. Do you think that vintage has always been your trademark pearl? Yes, yeah, so I didn't know about Rachel until about 10 years ago. My mum bought her book um, as a birthday present for me. And she and I was like, oh, my God, it's so similar to my aesthetic. You know, like it, it was just weird because I was really into the white stuff and then adding bits of pale colours and, you know, sort of pastel -y pinks and greens and stuff. And... And then, funny enough, I went, she opened a store. My mom said, you've got to go to a store in, in Notting Hill Gate. So I went down there and I walked in and I saw this sofa and I said, can I have that sofa, please? <laughs> and then when they were delivering, they said, Rachel would like to photograph your house for her book. I was like, yeah, sure. You know, and then we became really good friends. I mean, I think it's actually longer than 10 years ago now. But um, so I've actually featured in two of her books. And when she came to stay five four years ago I think it was she said listen you need to do a book on this house Pearl like I, it's so beautiful like we we need to do a book and that's how it came about so she art directed my first book which was called Faded Glamour and and then she's now art directed this one as well. Wow incredible and now of course it's really funny reading interviews about you as you always say it's your house it's kind of like a junkyard of sorts and that you're always selling things you know um would you say oh, I don't know should I say this that are you're a bit of a Dell boy I think is that you know things are always up for sale in your house is that true? <laughs> no that's what's so bad because you know, if my kids or my husband likes things and, it's, you know, he'll be watching television and I'll go, lift your feet up, we've sold the rug. And he'll be like, what do you mean? I like this rug. What do you mean we've sold it? And I was just like, somebody wants to buy it and it's, you know, it's fine. I'll get another one. <laughs> you know, so he, he it, we're constantly moving stuff in this house and it's really, I mean, he finds it really annoying, but I love it because I get bored of things, you see. So I put it in and and then I think, oh, that looks really nice. And I, really, and I live with it for a year and then I'm like, okay, I got to get rid of it now. <laughs> but how do you find things? What is it about your eye for things that would be different to mine? I think it does take practice because I think when you go somewhere, you do have to have a general idea of what you're looking for because otherwise it's a mindful. I mean, you can't just walk in and go, right, I'm going to get this 
frame and it's going to be a you know mother mary or whatever and but you won't find it but if you have a sort of very loose kind of idea then you might be able to pick up something and i definitely you know i'm always looking for persian rugs i mean it's the same thing that i've been looking for for the last 25 years you know it's sort of you know i like i i love like kind of bolster cushions and you know sort of french i kind of like french stuff and florentine stuff and so i if i see it i'm just like okay that's a good price i'll buy it you know and um and then i'll sell it on when i'm bored of it nice well you're always welcome to come and dicky up my house and mine <laughs> Now, speaking of friends, uh, we see that Helena Christensen, oh my God, she's so gorgeous, is also in the book. We both want to know, how did you angle that? So the thing with Helena, I have known her for a very long time. Um, and, you know, I don't know, I guess Instagram, we kind of reconnected because I was looking at her Instagram, just thinking, wow, it's amazing. Like her style, her interior style is incredible. Um and I noticed that she's got like a house on the, you know, on the beach and, you know, she's got, and then as soon as I, we decided to, to write this book and, and, and photograph it, I just emailed her and said, listen, would you be up for being in my book? And she was like, absolutely. I'm honored, you know? So, so it's great. So she's, she, I, I cause it's, it's difficult when you go and make a book because um, you've got to find people that have the same aesthetic as you, cause otherwise it's not going to work. You know, you can't put someone in that, you know, just because they have a, a, a coastal home, you know, because they have to be, uh, you know, it has to be the same style as yours. And that's quite hard to find because a lot of the coastal homes are quite generic and people tend to put, you know, blue and white ticking in the curtain. You know, it's just very generic. And I think that one of the things about this book is that it's not, it's kind of, I found places that are, are different and, and they're really completely original and they're, you know, they're one of a kind, so... So I'm amazed. You've been so eclectic with your work, not only in your books, but also in fashion. Where do you get all this inspiration from? I don't know. I mean, I just love anything that has a history, has a story, you know, when it, whether it's fashion or interiors. And I just, I, anything that's lived in, it just makes my heart sing. So I kind of, when I, when I design clothes, I generally you know, think I'll have a theme in my head. Like at the moment I'm into flapper girls in a really big way. Um, and so I'm trying to create a collection that kind of emulates that. And then I think, you know, but it's always something from the past. I'm very into glamour and obviously faded glamour because it's something that was once really faded, but a little bit rough around the edges. Once really glamorous, I mean, and then really faded now. But, um, and that's what I am, I guess. <laughs> once I was really yeah. glamorous, but now I've got Absolutely. holes in my shoes and tights and things. And, and, you know, I'm a little bit, you know, rough around the edges. So I guess it's just everything really. No, no, not at all. But of course, you've changed your lifestyle so much. Now I'm, um, I hate giving away my age, but I'm 45 and I grew up watching you party like like a total rock star amongst all the Primrose Hill set. I'm sure you remember them all as well. All that Brit pop era with like Kate Moss, Sadie Frost, Oasis, Blur, and all the 90s supermodels. So all of that hedonism, my God. <laughs> Have you um, slowed down or, or how do you slow down? I mean, I left London 17 years ago or 16 years ago. And I was pregnant with my daughter and I just wanted to change my life. I'd lived, I'd lived so much. I mean, you know, all that, the Primrose Hill set was obviously this kind of set that was written about and in the papers, but there were, I was around in the, you know, I was the one of the wild, the original wild childs, you know, I was, I was like 14, 15 going to all the clubs and would like hanging out with Boy George and Marilyn, you know, like I was just kind of having this mad life. And then I got in a band and then I was in the Britpop thing. So yeah. I've really lived. It's not just that, that scene was I, we worked it out the other day, it was like seven years. But before that, I had like years of going, kind of going crazy. So by the time I was, I hit 35, I was like, okay, enough. I've got to leave, I've got to, you know, I've got to be a good mom. I want to like, you know, you know, sort of just completely change my life. So we moved to, to, to the countryside and we've been there, we've been here ever since. Um, and it's been amazing and magical. And I don't think I could live the life that I live, honestly, I'm in bed by nine. I mean, I'm so boring. My kids think, my kids are like, mom, you know, I can't imagine you being what, they, they just have no idea because they, you know, they sort of laugh because I'm so boring now, you know? Pearl, there's no way you're in bed by nine o'clock. Not a chance. You couldn't be in bed at nine o'clock, are you? I am, I am. And the mad thing is, is that, you know, 
I honestly, honestly, am very content here. You know, it's not like, you know, I know that everyone probably thinks, oh my God, you had this mad life. And no, no. But honestly, I'm much happier now than I was then. Pearl, I hope you don't mind me saying this, but what I love about you is you're so honest, especially about your addiction. It's just really refreshing for everyone, you know, that you've shared this. So thank you so much. The thing is, I think it's really important to, um, you know, be honest and open if you've had an addiction, because if certainly if you've pulled yourself through it, because how you can help so many people. I wrote that book primarily to help people. It was really cathartic, but more than anything, um, you know, I had so many letters and, and emails and messages and direct messages and whatever, um, just saying, thank you, I've got sober now. And because of this book, you know, the book that I wrote. So in a way, I feel it's really important. And it's a really important message that I need to get out that I've turned my life around. I was an addict for many, many years. I was on the floor, I nearly died, I, you know, but I'm, but I got myself, you know, up and out and, and, and clean and sober for the rest of my days, you know, so and I don't know how I did that, but I, but all I know is, is that I live in the moment and I work on joy. Like I just find joy wherever I can. And, and it's, and, and creativity has really saved me as well. Good. Yeah, absolutely. Pearl, like us all, we all need to be yeah. creative, but tell us a little bit about your beautiful daughter, Daisy Lowe. Of course, we all know and love her. She's on every magazine cover and in, everywhere in the UK. I think she's a brilliant role model and she's very much in the public eye, especially now that she's become a mum herself. But, do you get very protective of her and um, you know what people say because sometimes people can say things that are good bad or indifferent but how do you protect Daisy well I do I mean I feel really protective over her especially since because she I don't know she's been really open about her mental health she had a really bad time a couple of years ago where she moved back here home with us and we had to look after her and everything and she's been very vocal about that again to help other people but there was a time when you know she gained a bit of weight and, and and you know you could just tell when she's being written about that people are kind of trying to insinuate that she's a big lady or whatever and and you just think god if you only knew what this girl has gone through and yet you're saying this but you're insinuating it's just so wrong you know but but she is in the public eye and and therefore you know you have to in a way expect some of that um, criticism or you know if you're putting yourself out there I'm not saying she's putting herself out there but I'm just saying she is out there so but it is tough as a mum because you just want to kind of wrap her up and say hey come back don't go there because <laughs> I kind of left that life for a reason you know because I was too sensitive and I couldn't cope with it all and I just wanted to kind of live a very anonymous life in the countryside. Do you think it's more difficult being in the public eye now than it was in the 90s? When I lived in London, we didn't have social media. We didn't have anything. You know, I think Facebook started when I, two years after I left, um, we sort of had MySpace a little bit where people could make comments. But so I think in a way you do have to just expect a little bit and try and ignore it because you know what it's like when you get older, you don't care. I don't care what people say about me, especially people who I don't know. I get things written about me all the time. I don't care anymore. You know, I just care about the people I love and, and the people around me that, you know, sort of, I, if they said something, I'd be upset, but you know, do you know what I mean? Like, it's kind of like, you know, it's, it's very important to keep very strong and, and, and just not worry about that kind of thing. What's nice to say as well, Pearl, is that if you don't mind me saying, you seem to have a beautifully blended family. Like people get married a second time round, of course they do. But you know what I'm, you know what I'm alluding to. Um, Daisy Lowe has Gavin Rosdale as her father, and of course Gwen Stefani as her stepmother, with all those gorgeous half brothers, three of them in fact. And um, so I suppose is it tricky at times to navigate those relationships? I mean, there's a lot there, and there's a lot of kids. Yeah. It hasn't been easy, um, but Daisy's been, you know, rebuilding her relationship with her dad. And I have been re rebuilding my relationship with him, too, because we haven't we didn't speak for a very, very long time. And, and now we're speaking again. And, you know, it's all good. It's all it's really sort of. Yeah, it's kind of there's a lot of us, definitely. And um, but it's it's funny because because he doesn't he lives in L.A. So it's sort of, you know, we it's just uh, why I say it's just us six because that's you know we live here and that's where Daisy lives. And Supergrass have reformed over the last year or two and they're back out on tour so does that mean that you go with Danny and your husband the drummer and the kids are all backstage with you? Yeah 100% because we went to Glastonbury and uh, the kids wanted to go in on Wednesday we went Thursday 
And then we were still in there on Sunday night and I was just like, oh my God, I'm too old for this. Like, but it was amazing. I got to see so many of my old friends and we danced and we saw so many great bands. We laughed like we've never laughed and it was great, but I was so excited to come home and just be really quiet and not see a soul, not talk to anyone, you know, because ultimately, you know, that's, it is, it's fun. And Danny's, you know, Supergrass have reformed. They reformed just before COVID. So they're only now, you know, playing at these big shows because obviously for the last two years they haven't been able to play them um and the kids it's so lovely for the kids because they were too little to understand the first time around you know they were babies when supergrass were big and playing these massive stadiums and things and so it's really not they're just like wow my dad's on stage you know it's like oh look at all these people watching him but it's great you know it's just kind of um and it's fun but you know ultimately I'm a Somerset girl. I just want to be in the countryside. <laughs> well, Pearl, bringing it back to Ireland, if you don't mind, since we are chatting to you from the Devlin here in Dublin, would there be a passion project to do a book maybe about Irish country house interiors? Oh, yeah. That would be good, wasn't it? Okay. And maybe, I know it's going to go off grid slightly for you there, but maybe you could give us a bird's eye view of your favourite Irish homes. Yeah, definitely. I, I love Ireland so much. I was there, um, I was um, in Dublin, like, just in the middle of COVID, um, maybe it was just before COVID, it was when Supergrass played, they just played and then it all kicked off. And I remember I had the best time and I just, every time I go, I have the most incredible time. And actually I do look at some of my friends who have houses there, they're beautiful, they're so beautiful. So yeah, definitely something, you know, I was thinking as I was um, driving this morning, I was thinking about, because I'm supposed to do three books in this series. So I did the Faded Glamour and I did Faded Glamour by the Sea. And the next one was going to be European Faded Glamour, but maybe I should do something in Ireland. I don't know. I just love, I love coming. And, and actually my youngest is quite keen on, her, her first choice is Trinity um, for her three unis. Yeah, she wants to study there, but apparently it's really hard to get into, but I don't know. <laughs> but she's really keen to, you know, to go there. So you never know. If she does, then I might end up being there for a couple of years. That would be a joy, Pearl. And you are so kind to take time out of your really busy schedule to chat with us. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. I'm so honoured that you've got me on your show. It's great. <laughs> Listen, best of luck with the new book, Faded Glamour by the Sea, and all of your interior endeavours, myself and Natasha. We'll be watching, yes, won't we? Yes, we will. Absolutely. Listen, thank you so, so much. From us here in the Devlin in Dublin, we'll see you soon. Take care. Take care. Bye. <laughs> For more on Pearl and her latest endeavours, check out pearllow.co.uk. This episode was sponsored by Ireland's leading bathroom brand, Sunnis. It's time to reimagine bathrooms. Be inspired at sunnisbathrooms.com. And if you want to keep up with the latest from Space to Grow, make sure to hit that subscribe button wherever you get your podcasts. And if you can, give us a rating or review. Thanks for tuning in and we'll see you next time on Space to Grow.